the psalm appointed is Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Our opening hymn is hymn 549.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You may kneel for confession. The Ninth Commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or get it in a way which only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. Have I longed for the honor, wealth, happy life, or what seemed the ease of the lives of others? Has my life been full of the craving for these things? Have I been stingy and self-indulgent with my money, trying to keep up with what others had? Have I rejoiced with a generous and good heart in the good things that come to my neighbors? Almighty God, have mercy Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, are the children of one's youth. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Merciful Father, your patience and loving kindness toward us have no end. <laughs> Grant that by your Holy Spirit we may always think and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the 20th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. The epistle is from Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God alone bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet, now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who, for a little while, was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I and the children God has given me. This is the word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house the disciples asked him again about this matter, and he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess our holy Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in...
In the name of Jesus, amen. In the epistle reading, we heard these words. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? What does this mean? To understand that verse, we need to go back to chapter 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. It means that if the message declared by the angels long ago to our fathers have been validated, how much more the words of those spoken by God's Son in these last days. If long ago they were to pay close attention to what was being spoken to them at Mount Sinai, and that which brought about a just retribution for their transgression and disobedience against what was spoken to them, how much more are we in these last days to pay much closer attention to the inescapable penalty for our neglect of even the greater gift of eternal salvation spoken to us through our Lord Jesus Christ? The word neglect. It means to fail to care for properly or to disregard or even to fail to do something. Neglect of such a great salvation. And all of that is fitting for our meditation today. But the ultimate answer is that we will not escape. That's the conclusion. Just as Israel did not escape, but they suffered the consequence of their carelessness in hearing the word and then not obeying God. And because of that, many were lost. Even more, we today, with our handling of the word of truth that is entrusted to us by the Son in not paying even closer attention. The argument here is that if God fulfills His Word in all matters of law and sin, even more so will He do in matters of gospel and forgiveness. And therefore, these words mean, listen to Him. For how much more shall His retribution be just towards those who neglect such a great salvation? And it may seem odd to us to hear it this way, until we see how appropriate this really is in addressing the handling of God's truth and His gospel today. The cry is pay close attention. No, even more so, pay closer attention. Give everything you can to hear. Exert all your attention, all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength to hear and so then receive deeply in contemplation that word of Jesus that brings life to the world. And then anchor your heart and your mind and your soul to that word. That you may not drift away like a rudderless ship with nothing to guide it. And so is left only to the whims of worldly winds and chaotic currents. Anchorless and so left vulnerable to the destructive torrents of this spiritually turbulent world and its hidden reefs and rocky shores that are sure to ground us. We remember Jesus' words in the Gospel last Sunday about how important it is that we hold our faith to the very end. Jesus spoke of this not only in words of horrific consequence, should we cause others, especially these little ones who believe in me, to sin and lose faith? But even with the great hyperbole of cutting off body parts that cause us to sin and so shakes us to the core, the core of our senses and awareness of the eternal cost of our carelessness and our cheapening of God's grace and our faith in that of others in matters of sin and error and neglect that carry with it 
the ultimate consequence of eternal torment, where we heard last week, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. These are Jesus' words. He speaks of hell's torment for a reason. He tells us of an everlasting worm that endlessly consumes one from within and a consuming fire that endlessly consumes one from without. And this is a just punishment equal to the offense that earns it. For the wages of sin is death. And such a death speaks of how offensive then sin really is to our righteous God. How our sins are such an offense to Him that warrant such an end and torment. Especially added to that today in the reading, neglecting such a great salvation. All sin is offensive to Him. Your sin. But so too we know that of our children. That is why the promise of the gospel is for you and your children. Therefore, as it is written, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. And what have we heard from Jesus today in the gospel reading? We heard of an indignant Jesus rebuking his disciples for making a major breach of understanding concerning his saving gospel. His disciples were actually excluding children from him and his blessing of them with his salvation. And that was no small thing at all because it caused a very telling response from him. First, it was not only little or toddler children that they were bringing, but we find out also they were bringing infants. And seeing this, surely, being so tiny, these little ones, they were not able to yet understand what Jesus was doing for them. We would acknowledge that. And most likely that was on the minds also of the disciples. These still rather adolescent and understanding disciples. And I will say, putting the best construction on it, it's the same for many adolescent and understanding Christians today. They reason that since these little ones don't understand yet for themselves the teachings and blessings of Jesus bestowed on them, it is then better to wait until they do before engaging these little ones in what they consider as only proper and necessary for adults. But that is a grave error. So much so that in all the times Jesus was disappointed with his disciples not understanding him or misunderstanding him or all the mistakes that they were making, this one in which he became indignant toward them. That means very, very displeased at what they were doing. And then we find out why. Because these little ones also need the same salvation as their parents and older adults. There's no exceptions to that. There is no special grace period for children simply because they are children. There is no biblical declaration of innocence in their sin until reaching the age of accountability. A purely human construct teaching them there is no need to bring them to Jesus for salvation until that time that they can finally account for their own sins and then decide for him themselves. My question to all who believe this, and you know them, I know them too, and my question is the same. Where is this ever taught in the Bible? Where is that? What is taught in the Bible, and there's a reason why you should know these things, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many have been misled by such thoughts and their little ones then left outside the kingdom? Remember here, again, the initial message. Pay attention. And even more so, pay more and closer attention. Because what you hear next 
is a matter that exceeds the rational mind and it centers in the very will and wisdom and means of God to save us. Jesus says, Jesus, truly, truly, and when he uses those two words, he grabs both of your ears I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And again, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And this does not in any way exclude children. I can't tell you how many times I've had to try to correct this with people. If we believe what Jesus says, we will see the comfort and meaning of this salvation for our children and rejoice in it, and we cannot help but bring them. Because the fact is quite opposite. Jesus, in high indignation toward his disciples, turns it all around on them. He turns the whole thing upside down when he says to them and to us all, let them come to me. Let them come. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And here's that word again. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. What does that say about all the others who believe you must become like an adult to enter it. Do they then truly enter it? Not only are little children included, as St. Peter himself came later to proclaim, he was corrected here on that day, as he proclaimed on the great day of Pentecost, learning his lesson and so preaching under the inspiration of the Spirit, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, laying upon the parents of all children the duty and responsible to bring their little ones to Jesus to that very place that he says that he is with his forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So too does Jesus then say that the little children, not the adults, are the actual model of those to whom such belongs the kingdom, the little children. It's not being a little child that hinders us and our ability to enter into the kingdom, but it is rather being a rational adult. Therefore, it is God's very will and his wisdom and his command that they especially be brought to him to receive salvation like all other sinners in fact they are to be the example among us and to all other sinners of what all must be like to enter into God's children our kingdom little children we heard that last in the last week or two in pastor Zeroth's sermons when Jesus hearing his disciples arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom took a little child and put him right before them and said, this is the greatest in the kingdom of God. A little child, a servant to all. And here again, he must make correction for the same error about the relationship of children to the kingdom of God and who we are before him. Therefore, it is his will that they be brought to him. And we are to pay much more closer attention to this. Little children in their unassuming humility and simplicity and even in their ability, their inability to come to him. That's why parents bring them. That's why those who brought the paralytic did so because he couldn't come to Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith for what they were doing for this one who could not bring himself. He not only healed that man, he also forgave his sins. May we learn from our Lord and watch him closely. So when his disciples then wronged those little ones, those helpless little children, in keeping them from him, that's when he got very displeased. 
I would ask the question for us all to contemplate. How much more today when parents are taught to refuse baptism for their children until their children are old enough to make that decision for themselves? When that happens and you hear that, know that two errors are happening here. For to make baptism a decision for themselves is no different than making faith a decision for themselves. And we find out that neither of those are the gospel. Because a decision made is not a gift given, but a human work. And people, that is what we call dragon speak. And where there is such dragon speak, that is, the lies and deceptions of the ancient serpent who wants to withhold and keep children from Jesus, we as those who are made alive by God's grace, who understand this rightly and correctly, are then to wield the power of His Word to destroy these arguments and these lofty opinions that people raise up against the knowledge of God, that all thoughts may be captive to obey Christ. Many have been misled by such deceiving arguments and opinions. And little ones are left outside the kingdom, jeopardizing their salvation, with baptism withheld from them because their parents were falsely taught and so believed that baptism was only an act of obedience possible for an adult, not an act of the triune God to adopt them as his children, to deed them a place in heaven and to give them the new birth in the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, those who need to hear this, as we all know, it's obvious, they're not here. But you are, and these words are as much for you as for them, so that you, you can bring them the truth of this. You can know what they don't know and bring to their knowledge the will of the Lord to bring their little ones to Him. Let the little children come to Me. And if they ask you why, tell them. Because when Jesus touched people, He healed them. And He made them alive again. And He was bringing about the new creation through that touch and that healing in restoring people by forgiving their sins but even more giving them eternal life in removing those sins and also removing from them the everlasting consuming word and fire of hell. That is the blessing of God. That is the touch of life. That is what it means to be touched by Jesus. That is what it means to be baptized into him. Is there any wonder then that the parents that day were bringing their children to Jesus? They didn't yet fully understand all that we know today because Jesus had yet to die and rise again. What they did understand is that God was among them and blessing their children in Jesus. What we do understand is that Jesus wants them. And those parents wanted life and blessing for their children. And they knew Jesus could and he would give it. Long ago, Moses also reminded the Israelites of the importance of that blessing of God for them and for their children when he said this to them. Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen. Do you hear that? Lest you forget. And lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. And this is emphasized over and over again. And yet much of Israel did perish in the wilderness because they did not pay close attention to the words of Moses, to the word of the Lord. And that's why he continued to exhort them to remember, remember, and remember, and make this word known to your children and their children's children. That is why I'm when his disciples were acting more like Pharisees who themselves did not enter the kingdom and were keeping others from doing so because they believed that they entered by their own efforts and works of self-righteousness, 
That is why Jesus said the words, release them. That literally is the Greek word that we translate, let them come. But the word is release them, and it's a play on words because it's the word also for forgiveness. It's like bring them, let them come, release them, let them be forgiven. So parents and grandparents, please do that and help others to know and do the same. Always seek to bring your children and grandchildren to Jesus because he is the word of life. The disciples, again, were acting like Pharisees, keeping children away from Jesus, from touching, from him touching them. And yet, why were they disciples? Their role was actually to bring people to him. And that's why he is indignant with them and literally mad. What are you doing? It is precisely to such as these who are to be blessed by me. In fact, you wayward thinking and ignorant and know-it-all disciples, you must become like one of these little infants that you're withholding from me. You must become like an infant if you yourselves are going to enter into my kingdom. You must receive it like that little child as a pure gift of grace, not by your adult reason or accountability, not by your decision or your merits, but as a pure gift, nothing else, just as children do. So, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it, and we neglect the great salvation, not only for us, but for our children and for those around us who we know may be withholding this from their kids. So let us attentively hear the words of Jesus. Let us faithfully pass on to our children and grandchildren that great faith and blessing of eternal life in the waters that connect them and unite them with their Christ. All need to be diligent in this, in the hearing of the word. We are not here, Christians, to be pew potatoes, disengaged from the service and preaching, because at the end, those will only find a boiling pot of water. But rather, you and I and all of us are to be on high alert, high alert for the devil's deceptions and his ways of twisting the word that keeps people away from his grace and the means by which the gospel is applied to us. We are to be prepared students of his word. We are to be touched by him and alive in every way and in every word that comes from his mouth. We are to be fed by him. We are to drink from this cup of the New Testament on the altar. We are to partake of the very gospel of sins forgiving and the life everlasting in Christ our Lord. And we must learn above all this very well, that the soul can only be helped and saved by that word. And where the word is missing, The soul suffers and cannot be helped. But if the soul has the word of life, it has everything it needs to live and to live eternally, even those of our little babes. May we then fill them also with Christ, our children, here in the church, there at home, always feeding their souls the food of immortality, that is Jesus in his word, And wherever his word is, we know that Jesus is also there forgiving sins and imparting eternal life. Because the words were spoken, the promise is for you and your children. What greater comfort can there ever be for a parent or a child than this? So bring them, and the Lord will surely bless them. In his name. Amen. Let us pray. Thanks be to you, our Lord and our God, for instituting the holy estate of matrimony and preserving it for so many ages against the assaults of that apostate spirit, which is an enemy of all that is pure and godly, and for the fruit of their marriage, children, for your kingdom. Therefore, make every house your temple. Fashion the hearts of husbands and wives to love their children, to baptize them, and to teach them the ways of the Lord, even in their years of infancy. And so cause both parents and children then 
to walk forever as disciples of our Lord in the faith of your Son, and so be saved. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Loving Father, your Son took the little children into his arms and blessed them. Help your saints to welcome little ones with joy, that nothing may hinder their entrance into the kingdom of God and the arms of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, you give us men to guide your church on earth. We ask your blessing for Matthew, our synod president, Richard, our district president, and for all pastors together with the many servants and treasures of your church. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, be near all couples struggling in their marriages. Guard them from hardness of heart that would separate what you have joined together, and reconcile them to one another to live in Christ's forgiveness and love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, be near to families torn apart by adultery and divorce. Sustain and heal, heal the wounded with your love. Give repentance to the guilty and hope in your forgiveness in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, grant your wisdom to Joseph, our president, to all public servants, and to those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection to you in every place, that they may be strengthened and upheld in every good deed. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, your thoughts are not our thoughts, and your ways are not our ways. In your wisdom, you have permitted a disastrous hurricane to affect a part of our country in the south and the east to come to us. Lord, we pray that we implore you, let not the hearts of your people despair, nor our faith fail us, but sustain us all and comfort us through this disaster. We pray that you direct all efforts to attend to the injured to console the bereaved, to protect the helpless. Bring hope and healing that they might find relief and restoration. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious God, you promised to be with us and your people and uphold us all in our sufferings. Comfort all who are sick and are sorrowing. For Terry and, Lor for Terry and Lorraine Hively, especially during the celebration of their 60th wedding anniversary, that you continue to sustain them and, and comfort them through all trials and afflictions, but also the joys that they have experienced of 60 years of wedded bliss. Continue to bless them and their family. We pray for Sandra Wolf, Bob and Patty Hunter, Dennis Mertz, Destiny Gingrich, Stephanie Bining, Jerry Hapke, Alex Rodinius, James and Holly Parker, Tammy Fraser, Ken Noland, Edie, Aubrey Vickers, for Sharon, and for all others whom we name in our hearts this day. Strengthen their faith in the midst of their trials and grant them health and healing according to your good and gracious will. Lord, in your mercy. <clears throat> Holy Lord, your Son gives us his very body and blood to eat and drink in the supper. Grant to your grace that we may approach your table with repentant hearts and a firm resolution to amend our sinful lives by the help of your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, help us by your Spirit to fear you and walk in your ways in Christ, 
that we may eat the fruit of the labor of our hands and receive your blessing in all that we do. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and after he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same manner also, after he had supped, he had taken the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, one and all, a special welcome to visitors with us today. The Lord's blessings to you, and we're happy that you have come to be here with us. Please come again. Oh, just a few announcements, uh, several of them, actually. Today we celebrate uh, the LWML Sunday, Lutheran Women, Women's Missionary League, or Lutheran Women in Mission is how they refer to themselves. If you see someone dressed in purple today, please approach them and we'll thank them. There's Marsh over there in purple. Yes, I'm sorry. Well, you, you roar it. I had to point you out there. I'm sorry. But uh, we give thanks to God for all of these women and their tremendous effort to bring the gospel to uh, every most part of the world. And I've, I've been a district counselor myself, and uh, uh, these women work hard to collect their mites, uh, monies, checks, uh, to spread the gospel. So we do collect mites today. They can be turned in any time, of course, but, but if you have brought your box or uh, would like to present an offering today, you may do so. So thank you uh, for your support. Today at the seminary, or also this week, Sunday, October the 6th, today is the deadline for any food items you want to bring to the seminary co-op, and a list of items are there for you in the newsletter. Uh, this Friday, the 11th of October, is Grandparents VIP Day for our school from 1 to 3 o'clock, so please join your grandchildren if you have them in school. and. Uh, and enjoy the couple of hours you'll have with pictures and other activities and treats. Uh, the fall festival is this Saturday at 3 to 5. Games, food, hay rides, and lots of fun. We still need a few volunteers yet, so uh, uh, there's also a cakewalk, I see. So uh, please come. We have Friday, we have Saturday, and lots going on at our school to celebrate with our children and our grandchildren. Um, Reformation is coming October 27th. We'll just repeat this uh, every Sunday that we're gonna have only one service on Sunday for Reformation Day, a nine o'clock uh, discipleship classes and then a 10:15 service together. And then we'll have a potluck lunch afterwards. So it's kind of Reformation week or month rather. And so I'm gonna uh, show my Reformation slides for Bible study for the next few weeks. and. Uh, get a taste of Germany and uh, the, the wonderful opportunity Joanne and I had to travel in that country. And um, any middle schoolers? Sir, do you see anybody in your class? No, I don't see anybody, so I can't invite them to come, but you'll see them, you'll, you'll draw them over there and everything else. Today also we have a, a special uh, recognition of Ray Bates, who has uh, been our handbell director for several years. We're gonna honor him uh, just before discipleship class in the fellowship hall and thank him and thank God for his work among us as he retires from the handbells. So we look forward to being with Ray in a few moments. Pastor Geyer, anything else? Okay. 